part. Okay, I'll okay. go. To... Okay, we're going live. We're back. Says live. You did it. Congratulations. We did. That's very exciting. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We are thrilled to be talking to one of our favorite people, Jane Ann Krentz, who has started a new series um, called Sleep No More. And she has autographed our copies, which are went on sale Tuesday, actually, which we have in abundance down at the bookstore. So <laughs> I hope that you will order one. So, Jane, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be with you for a little bit, and then John's going to talk to you about the book. But I wanted to tell you that I did an event with Carol Blackstone. Do you remember her that wrote um, Mirrorland? Yes, okay. I do. Yes, so I she do. went even more gothic with her new book. And Tuesday, when we did her book launch, I asked her, she said it's a gothic horror novel. So I asked her to define that. And I want you to watch it because she gave one of the best definitions that I have ever heard. She was really together. She put together a whole lot of points. All right, I will check it out. Um, I just did another Zoom event today with, with another group and and they were talking about how much, so many people love dark academia, mm -hmm. which was kind of like, a seemed like a little subset to begin with. And now I guess it's become a hugely popular end of the Gothic. It's a thing again, you know, yeah. it's sort of like Dorothy, Dorothy Sayers and Gowdy Knight taken to some, um, it, well, of course, it's really Donna Tart. But yeah. I also think that, you know, there's a, I mean, we see it in your book because, you know, is there any, are there supernatural elements? Yeah, well, it depends. I, I, I define supernatural as ghosts and werewolves and vampires and that sort of thing. I do the psychic vibe. And for me, the psychic vibe is one step beyond intuition. So I'm not so sure that the whole supernatural thing is a good explanation for what, what I'm working with, but it's it's close enough. I mean, it's <laughs> it, it makes it a gothic for sure. Well, I think, you know, it's extra power. It's maybe a slightly different look at time. Um, you know, there are a lot of different elements that play play into it, but it seems like, um, everybody's fascinated with playing around with time or, you know, extrasensory powers, not just the standard, you know, Anne Rice kind of vampire book or, or yeah. ghost story. But I mean, Carol's book has what appears to be sort of a normal girl, but, um, but she's not. Um, and I can't, I don't want to talk about it because I will spoil it. Um, it's beautiful about the island, but one thing she talked about which I think is important, um, is that usually the Gothic horror has some kind of beautiful landscape, you know, in addition to a probably some kind of closed environment. You know, you've got your sleep institute here and you've got a small town, um, but you know, often it's a castle or it can be a campus, which I think the campus acts really in that same way, you know, kind of a Agatha Christie thing. but. I like the fact that she talked about usually it's beautiful. Do you think in, in those terms? I had heard, they thought of it as dramatic. I always think of it as cliffs, pounding surf, you know, that drama, which is beautiful in its own way, darkly beautiful, <laughs> dramatically beautiful. <laughs> well, she's out in the Outer Hebrides. And I'll tell you one more thing, and then we're going to talk about your book. Um, I it's Harrison Lewis. Now, I have been to Shetland and the whole bit, but I've never been to Shetland and Lewis. I've only been as far as Sky. Rob still has, my husband has a coat that he's like 60 years old that's a Harris tweed, which is never going to wear out. I mean, it's <laughs> never going to wear out. And I said to her, so, you know, you're spending time there. I said, how's the weaving going? She said, they have a new industry. You ready for this? Gin. I said, Gin. I said, so what have they done? Put in a juniper plantation or something? And she said, no, they make it from seaweed. Oh, my gosh. Well, you can that... gin from anything, I guess. I, know. <laughs> I was just fascinated with that. So, I mean, you know, Rob's been going around saying seaweed, gin. <laughs> What's that? So, what could go wrong? Yeah. I know. It's <laughs> wonderful things you can learn. So, John has read your book and loves it. And you're talking about... Um, sleep dis well sleepwalking sleep dysfunction the sleep apnea yeah. actually it's not really part of this right no no this is more about 
sleep deprivation and nightmares, those kinds of issues. And uh, the whole sleep clinic thing is just in a weird way, kind of always fascinated me because who checks into a sleep clinic? I mean, you'd have to be really desperate to check into a sleep clinic, right? It's um, but it turns out somebody I know was, and they did. And I got the whole lowdown on, it's not that big a deal, actually. You just go in, they just hook you up to a lot of monitors and stuff. But um, from that concept, the rest of the story kind of took off. A, a sleep clinic where you can check in, but maybe not check out. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, if you're in induced sleep, you you know, you know may not be responsible for what's going on. I think one of the values of a sleep clinic is that, you know, if people are just dependent on chemicals to get any sleep, it can really warp your life. And isn't the object of a sleep clinic to try to move you past that so that you can do a more natural sleep? I think so. I think, first of all, it's just diagnosis because a lot of sleep problems are things like sleep apnea, which can be fixed. So um, I, I think it's often that. But the sleep clinics um, in the past, at, at one time, Stanford, for example, had a major dream analysis clinic where people would sleep and dream. And they, they, were, look, they were looking at the kind of dreams that terrifying dreams, you know, people who suffer from chronic nightmares and stuff like that. Um, so there's other things that can, can get studied in a sleep clinic. But uh, for me, it was just a good scene for a murder. <laughs> well, it really is. And you've got three women that you have brought together through trauma and off they go. So I'm going to leave you two to talk about it, but I'm so pleased to see you. I'm hoping maybe, maybe in May, maybe you might well, actually be able to come see us. I hope so. I hope so. Thank you so much for inviting me. I miss you guys. <laughs> well, we miss you too, but I'm glad we get to stay in touch this way. So thank you guys. Have a good time. Bye. Good evening, Barbara. Have a good evening. Let's start, Jane, by for those that have not um, read the book yet, can you give us the elevator pitch to kind of entice us? Three women show up for a job interview at an old resort, which of course happens to be a modified sanitarium. Mm -hmm. They walk in the front door of the lobby and they don't wake up until the following morning in the middle of an earthquake. And they realize they've lost a whole night of their lives. The other thing that has changed is they've all gained some kind of psychic power. Mm -hmm. So something happened to them during that night and they're determined to find out what. And they launch a podcast aimed at investigating other cases that are similar to theirs in an effort to solve their own cold case. And the adventures are... So the stories within the stories, each book can stand alone because each is a separate murder mystery. But then there's this overarching mystery of what really happened to them during mm -hmm. that missing that missing night. So it's my first amnesia book. Really? All the books I've written, this is the first time I've messed around with amnesia. That's like a classic Gothic kind of trope or whatever they call it, story element. People love it and mm -hmm. writers love it. I don't know why I haven't done it before. <laughs> <laughs> For one thing, it's kind of tricky to plot. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I can imagine. Um, well, in your usual brilliant fashion, you also, um, it's the sleep clinic setting is, works beautifully because your uh, hero, Ambrose, is there being treated and he thinks he sees a woman's body being wheeled out. Well, if you're committing murder, you want to do it in that setting because no one believes the people that are there. They're already experiencing a disconnect from reality they're, they're having nightmares that, or they're asleep and they're not mm -hmm. gonna yeah um and he's hallucinating when it happens so uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so how do you prove that you saw a murder when there's no body mm -hmm. and no evidence and everybody says you dreamed it well he turns to the heroine palace which is a really terrific name for heroine and so one, of the, one of the last uh, <laughs> new names that I haven't actually used. <laughs> <laughs> if you saw my name, the baby book, and everything crossed out, crossed out. <laughs> I'm down to the more, the more unique names. Yeah. In the book. Um, well, she's the one who has the true crime podcast. And so she has kind of a reason to believe Ambrose because of her own experiences with reality and not reality, I guess. 
and this the whole psychic back well and and not being believed mm -hmm. she empathizes with that because she and her friends were not believed when they try to explain that something strange happened to them in this old sanitarium that they can't remember everybody thinks they're just yeah. either going for the the advertising you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the clicks the yeah. sensation or uh to promote their own podcast or that they were doing drugs and can't really remember what happened so nobody believes them so that's they're on their own and ambrose is also in the same boat but he's a writer on a deadline so he's he's, he's on the clock he's got a book he's got to finish and he can't finish it as long as he can't sleep more than cat naps and he doesn't dare sleep more than cat naps short little sleeps because he sleepwalks now <laughs> and the sleepwalking has become very dangerous so which is one of the reasons he's at the sleep clinic try and get the sleepwalking under control did you channel some of your own experience as a writer into Ambrose's <laughs> fears of missing deadlines and whatnot? Yeah, that whole thing about um, most, most of his throwaway lines were very meaningful. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if, if Ambrose is commenting on the world at large, readers or other people, that's probably, probably either me or some writer I know said that. Another thing that really works for the book, and I don't know whether it's just by natural instinct or whether you actively um, plot this out, but it's both, um, it's got that kind of au courant feel because you're talking about podcast, true crime podcast, which is all the rage, I guess, for the last couple of years. But you've also got this little town with this creepy old sanitarium, which is so 1960s and things like that. So was that <laughs> intentional to just all come together happily? Are you just a master at plotting? <laughs> <laughs> One wishes. Um, well, I've lived in enough college towns to kind of know there's a there's a vibe. If if you were in a small town and the college is at the center of it, it usually is literally at the center of it, and it dominates a lot of the it the politics in the area. It dominates. It just has a huge amount of influence. Um, so so it kind of. Once you say college town, a small college town, there's a it, the whole world is kind of right there, and most people recognize it or have a a sense of it. I think even if you never went to college, you kind of know what a college town would look like, and that gives me the small community that I needed. Mm -hmm. uh, because if the plotting with a big city gives you a lot of <laughs> way too many suspects, mm -hmm. but the college town gives you a defined set of suspects, and that's always what you're looking for as as when you're writing this kind of mystery. Um, but I also think that the call, the whole sleep clinic thing um, was it was an, was a was an attempt to get at something that I've always been fascinated with, which is dreams. Mm -hmm. I find dreams very um, everybody like everybody finds them interesting, not other people's dreams, but our own dreams. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is kind of funny. The most boring thing in the world is to listen to somebody else's dream, but your own really impact you sometimes and i think that dreams the fact that we know so little about them even after all these years of studying them is a great leap into the psychic thing it makes a nice it makes a nice segue for me as a writer to slide from dream research into the whole psychic thing because we it's something we don't really know enough about to make statements on and so i can say anything i want well, you've kind of flirted with dreaming in previous books too, lucid dreaming and things like that. So you have the background in that area. Yeah, and it's just always fascinated me. Let's talk a little bit about your writing process because this is the first of a new trilogy and you've explained for those that aren't used to romance, trilogy doesn't mean you have to read every book. They all stand alone, but there's kind of that overall, overarching storyline that connects them. Do you know in advance how book two and three and book two and book three are going to play out? Are there things that you have to know? There are some core things that I've set out that I'll have to deal with, but I kept it to a minimum because I know that I'm going to get better ideas as I go along and I didn't want to be tied down. I didn't want to have the whole thing mapped out and then be stuck with it if a better idea came along because sadly, I'm one of those writers who gets the best ideas 
after I start writing not <laughs> up front. Um, I would love to have them all up front with a storyboard and a nice little outline and everything just neat and tidy, but I don't. And so the whole thing just spins off the fact that these three women have this one night of amnesia that they shared that they're going to have to resolve, find the answers to. And I think after that, for me, writing is always asking questions and then finding answers and then asking mm -hmm. another question. Somebody asked me the other day what era I would live in if I could choose to live in any era. Mm -hmm. And I realized it would be now, not because of the good, good toilets and sanitation mm -hmm. <laughs> necessarily a factor. Healthcare, yeah. Yeah, healthcare. But now, because this is the one time we don't know the answers, we don't know what's coming next. Hmm. And it's that's where my curiosity is. Hmm. Um, so, so that's the process of writing plays to that. My intrigue with the questions, my curiosity, basically. I think that's fascinating because I dug up an old quote from you about your writing process, and for a publication, you said, "For me, writing is a lot like trying to wipe fog off a mirror. I keep taking swipes." until suddenly everything comes into crystal clear focus. Unfortunately, that usually takes until I get to the very end of the first draft. <laughs> Sadly, uh, I, I never know where I'm going until I get there. It does. I, I'll, be, I'll be madly coming up with a great idea in the final chapter that I know I'm going to have to go back and, and work into the story. But, I, but once I'm there, I've got the whole vision in my head. That's my happy place. Then I can rewrite because I know exactly where I'm going and the picture is clear. Um, but getting there is a somewhat <laughs> painful process. That's uh, the work, the hard work part. Writing it for, I think for almost anyone is hard work. It's not the kind of illusion that you see on movies and television. Um, Barbara Cartland in a pink negligee <laughs> eating bonbons. Um, and for those of us too young to know who Barbara Cartland are, Google it, <laughs> you'll discover. Um, your heroine dabbles, well, she doesn't dabble, it's kind of a side hustle for her in true crime podcasts. Are you a fan of true crime podcasts? Do you read true crime? Not really, um, but it's such a big factor in the podcast community. Mm -hmm. My favorite podcast, the one I actually do li listen to, um, is the one that Sarah McLean and Jim oh, yeah. are doing mm -hmm. called Fated Mates. Mm -hmm. And they're doing nothing less than really recording the modern history of the romance genre and, and how we got where we are, where the genre is going, the romantic suspense, all the branches of romance and sub-romance that have come along, the editors who made changes along the way, you know, who made an impact along the way, the writers who changed things. Um, it's, just a, it's just a brilliant piece of contemporary history in real time. Um, and anybody out there who's interested in the genre or any of the subgenres related to romance, I highly recommend checking out the Fated Mates podcast. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Um, let's go back a little bit in time in your literary career because some people don't realize you've been writing for quite a while. You're a legend in the genre. We won't say how many years because that dates Thank you. both of us. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah John. <laughs> I was there too, yeah. Keep that, keep that in mind. Um, but for some people today with the rise of indie publishing, they don't kind of understand or grasp what it was like back then when you broke into the writing business because you came at it through traditional publishing, but through something called series or category romance, didn't you? Yes, back in those days, there was no option. There was no real version of self-publishing that, that we know today. If it had been, I would have jumped all over it. I'm, uh, that's definitely what I would have done. But it was either traditionally published in New York or one of the big publishing houses or not. That was the option. And it took me six years. It's such a crapshoot. It's such a matter of luck, you know, hitting the right editor or the right agent on the right time when they happen to think that that's what the market is looking for. Um, it, it's a huge learning curve at the beginning, it's always a learning curve, but it's a huge learning curve at the beginning, understanding that half of this job really is business. Mm -hmm. um, and the infrastructure that takes to get a book published in print and in a bookstore 
is very impressive. It's a lot of infrastructure. And that was, so if they buy, if they pick up a book for, to commit to it, they're going to want to be sure they can sell it. Mm -hmm. And they, like anybody else, it's like, where am I going to sell this book? That's, that's their first question. And at the time, back at the beginning, the American market was not really wide open for romance at all. Mm -hmm. Most of the romance we read here, it came from Mills and Boone and Harlequin, um, which for, for those who don't remember is originally the UK and then in Toronto. Um, and they pretty much dominated the market. But as I recall, I don't recall any other venues no, I think gradually a few publishers, once they realized the readers were there in the 80s, Love Swept and some of the other lines um, kind of came into existence. Um, but in some ways it was really remarkable because that was a really terrific, and I say this with all respect, training ground for a lot of writers who went into that particular section of publishing and got basically an education, I think. Yes, well, I think it was a place you could start. Um, mystery always had the mystery journal, you know, the uh, the mystery um, magazines. Mm -hmm. There were there were places for mystery Ellery queen, yeah, things like that. There were places for mystery writers to start. There were places for science fiction writers to start. Um, but there really wasn't the closest thing we got to that was the category romance, and and then when it went big in, in the U.S. when the market exploded because it really had been there all the time. Um, there were a lot of new lines and, and, and for a while it, it was great. It was, <laughs> you could just, you, you could sell anywhere, but mm -hmm. uh, that, that golden moment didn't last too long and things closed down as they always do. And to the, mostly the big houses, the big publishing mm -hmm. houses and the rise of indie publishing. Mm -hmm. When you were getting your start out, um, you kind of had to adopt different pseudonyms, which gave rise to your um, career as Jane Ann Kranz, Jane Castle, and Amanda Quick. Was that something intentional? Was that something you kind of did just? No, it's because I managed to murder my own career at various points along the way. <laughs> wrong book, wrong time, wrong, wrong publisher. There were a million ways to kill off a career and I did it a few times and then you have to reinvent yourself. Hmm. And I usually tried it under another name because I figured I had so much baggage under the old name that I would never be able to sell a book um, to a publisher. So I'd come up with a new name and start over again. And after a while, it sort of settled into, I, I always told myself, I'll go with the name that works. And then three of them worked. <laughs> that's where I am now. <laughs> and if there are aspiring writers out there, I always give this advice. John's heard me say this a million times. Don't use a bunch of pen names. It's a really, really bad idea. <laughs> the reason it's a really, really bad idea is because you are going to have to build a brand under each name. And that's almost impossible to do. One is going to take everything you have. So um, for what it's worth, my advice is just don't go with a bunch of pen names or you'll end up like me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think many writers would aspire to where you're at. But I think in some sense, I think you're right about that. But I think in another sense, it really works for you as a writer because you have these three distinctive sub-brands, sub-genres, so readers can know which book they want. And there are some readers who don't want to read futuristic. They don't want to read contemporary with your three-pronged literary attack, they know exactly which books. Some read all of them because your voice is the same in each different um, story you tell, but the settings, the world may be slightly tweaked or slightly different. So they can they can gravitate to what they want. Whereas if you had one name, if it was just Jane Ann Krantz, I can see how some readers might pick up a book and discover, well, I don't wanna read something set in the 1930s. I want Jane with her dust bunnies. Yeah, I think if I had to do it over again today and had that option, I'd stick with one name mm -hmm. and then I'd identify the world underneath it somehow, the universe oh. underneath it somehow. There, there, there must be a way to do that. Um, a historical world or a regency by Jane, you know, you know, mm -hmm. something that would tell the reader which world it was. The three names do that. Um, 
but I think you could do it with one name. Well, well, Christina Dodd does it that way. Mm -hmm. She always uses Christina Dodd, but she has um, her, her, her different worlds are clear enough on the covers, I think. So. Yeah, Christina kind of breaks a lot of rules that other people couldn't get away with. But, yeah. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about your literary brand, because there's a lot of um, interest in the publishing world and how authors define themselves. I like to call it the author's voice, how they're telling the story. But for someone who's never read your books, is not familiar with you, how would you describe your brand, your voice? I write romantic suspense usually with a psychic twist. And I write toward the lighter side. I am not the, the, the dark, um, dramatic writer. It, mm -hmm. I'm, my characters are more, it's a very dialogue-driven style, mm -hmm. and the dialogue lends itself to a lot of wordplay. So that tends to lighten the stories. Um, I don't know beyond that how much. Um, and I don't know how, how would you describe it? You're the, the professional well, reviewer. <laughs> you're right that you, when you say you're right to the lighter side, you have a very distinctive sense of humor. It's a very sharp sense of humor. I kind of think of if um, Dashiell Hammett, who wrote um, Nick and Nora Charles Mysteries, wrote Romance, Romantic Suspense, it would be what you were writing. You have that kind of banter between the characters, that kind of dry sense of humor. Um, there's a little bit of sensual sizzle to the story, but it's not over the top. Um, it's very fast paced. You're not someone who tends to write pages of descriptive, evocative <laughs> scenery. And, th and there are writers that do that beautifully. And that's, all I mean, just look at Daphne du Maurier and the opening of Rebecca. You, I don't think, it would be a very different book if you had written that book. <laughs> That's <laughs> but, for sure. Yeah, those are your strengths. And I think the one thing that I have always admired about your books is your voice is consistent. It doesn't matter which book you pick up, it's there. And I think, um, if I remember correctly, one of the pieces of advice that you give to aspiring and even established writers is the one thing you have control of it in your career is your writing voice. Can you expand on that? I think it's very important to figure out what your voice is, identify your voice and your core story, because the two are combined, I think, and hone it, sharpen it. Don't try to modify it. Try it well, except in, to make it stronger, mm -hmm. because what you're really looking after is a memorable voice. You want people to either love you or hate you, but not forget you. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a matter of your storytelling voice. And it's a matter of your core story. And the, my core story, I am not talking about the fictional landscape that you, you prefer. You might like to do contemporary noir mysteries, or you might like to do a futuristic science fiction, or, or you might like to do medievals, whatever. Those are fictional landscapes. And the core story is really about the emotional themes and the conflicts that compel you as a writer, that's where your real power comes from. And the, and the joy of identifying, you can write intuitively your whole career and never know all this stuff and you'll do just fine if you get lucky. But luck, is, luck does run out in this business from time to time. And that's what it pays to know your core story because you will realize you're not trapped in that particular fictional world that you've been writing in. You can take your core story anywhere because hmm. they're universals. And uh, I think it just behooves a writer early on to get a handle on the core story and figure out what their strengths and weaknesses are as a as a writer and play to the strengths. Don't try to play it against them. I have I tried that in the past. I remember having a long conversation with a friend who wrote dark, very dramatic, emotional, um, heavy heavy kinds of reads, and did it brilliantly. And I envied her that ability because it's just not part of my natural voice. And she said, I'd give anything to be able to write light. Mm -hmm. It's just who we are and you are what you are. And the best thing you can do is build it, make it stronger. Looking back over your career and what you know about publishing, 
what piece of advice would you give yourself if you could go back in time when you were first starting out as a writer? What would you tell yourself? Um, believe in your own voice because there'll be times in this business when you are the only one who does. Yeah. And that's not to say that you should set yourself up against every editor who wants to mm -hmm. help you. That's not what I mean by that. But believing in your own voice and identifying and figuring out what it is will help you decide where it fits best into the, that market of that time. Mm -hmm. That's just invaluable. Um, there's a million, a million things I could have told myself. <laughs> but it's, it, and you do have to remember this is a business. Mm -hmm. One of the things I hear, I, I've done a little, uh, a few workshops and yeah. I'll, there's always someone who's got going bold, the brave new writer who's going to write the most original story in the whole world, right? Mm -hmm. Usually that means bending genres, you know, pulling, pulling genres in. And I always say, just be really careful going down that route, especially at the start of your career. Because the first thing an editor or an agent is going to say is, where's the market? Who is the market for this book? And when that book hits the bookstore, you can tell us you're going to have to shelve it. Mm -hmm. And how do you make that decision? It's by genre. That's actually very smart because in libraries and bookstores, if you write something that's a historical fantasy, um, detective novel or something like that, where where do you put it? And I know we don't like to assign categories to books. That's in the analysis to a, us as readers, librarians, booksellers. But realistically, are you going to miss readers if your particular book is in the fantasy section? You might look be looking for a romance book. So yeah, you're right, it, it does. And I, every editor that I've ever talked to says the best advice they can give is pick a lane. Huh. Pick a lane and work in that lane. Don't hop around too much because you will, it, that's a very hard way to build a career. Mm -hmm. Do we, and, and, and the flip side of that is be reassured, be reassured that what your audience really wants is the same thing you gave them last time, just different. <laughs> they don't want you to be totally original every time they want the same mm -hmm. emotional punch mm -hmm. whatever that punch was that's what they want again um and it's up to you to make it look fresh but don't beat yourself up trying to do something totally totally different and off the wall well once again in your usual brilliant fashion you've um crystallized it because you're right readers they want something familiar and comfortable but they also want to be entertained with something new and that's the challenge for any long established writer is how do you keep providing the same comfort elements that readers want while also making it interesting for them and for you yeah yeah but that's what that's what any genre is all about and i say that meaning the literary genre too mm -hmm. um, th those writers have the same kind of problem that really the they have to produce whatever the, whatever punch they gave last time to their readers that's they've got to figure out a way to do it again and i think it's even more challenging today for writers because in the past and again i'm dating myself when you go back you would expect an author maybe if you were lucky to turn out a book once a year and that was a big deal. Sometimes you, it was several years. Now it's like if you're not producing something every six months, you know, you lose your place. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. I always, and, the, and a lot of the writers I came up with, never got that luxury. <laughs> because, <laughs> because if there's one thing starting out in category does teach you is that you're going to have to be prolific to survive. Hmm. And most of us who started out in category were doing four books a year at one time in our early careers. Some were doing six. And that was, granted, they were shorter. You know, they were mm -hmm. 60,000 words, but still you've got to do everything in a 60,000 word novel that you got to do in a 100,000 word novel in terms of plotting and character development and, you know, the whole, the whole thing. Um, so that was very tr good training ground for what has become now the routine. Yeah. What do you what do you see which what do you see with the one book writers one one book a year writers like over in the mystery or suspense markets um, how are they keeping up what 
are they getting by with that one book a year or is it yeah i think it depends on on the writer i'm the one and i'm not a professional writer so take my, any advice i give with the generous grain of salt but um writers if you're a writer or aspiring to be a writer you need to do what's best for you and some people can write three books a year and they can be terrific and some people can only write one book a year or one book every other year pushing yourself to write something and then turning out a product that's not up to your standards as a writer is just in the end gonna disappoint everyone your readers will not come back to you so it's it's challenging because you do get that pressure as a writer to we have slots to fill and if you lose your slot you know good luck it's next year before you get it again um i think if a writer what i want as a reader is i want the experience of falling in love with the book and if it takes you a year to do that, I will wait. I may not be happy about it, but I will wait for it. As long as, long as you deliver that to me, I'm satisfied. Yeah, and I agree. I agree. But still, two or three years pass. It's that can, well, I mean, there are some writers who can do it, but that's a challenge in and of itself. Then yeah. it becomes the books have to be these big statement pieces yes. that kind of, Either that or you have to somehow be connected to a different industry like television or movies or something that can promote the book to a different level. Honestly, you know, why on earth anyone wants to be a writer? I do not know, but <laughs> <laughs> there are people out there who do. So um, these are, listen to Jane's words, words of wisdom <laughs> and you'll get and further along. The other thing is um, that I would say to aspiring writers is, as you said, you can't, um, you can't totally be immune to criticism you have to take in criticism and accept what's good and reject what's bad but sometimes if you're writing and you're not your book is not accepted by a particular publisher or editor it's not you or the book it's the editor you haven't found the right match and that connection between the writer and the editor is very important because that's the first step in getting the book to readers Yes, it has to be the ideal situation for a writer is to find an editor who gets your, the global view of your book the, mm -hmm. and responds to it. And not all of them will. That's just the way so of the yeah. You have to try again. Yeah. That, and that's why there's such such amount of luck involved that finding that match. Mm -hmm. I think I think it in the old days, the probably the easiest way to do it was often at the writers' conferences, mm -hmm. big writers' conferences where editors and agents circulate and you can actually meet and talk with them. Um, we lost that during the pandemic. I, I, I think it's coming back. I noticed that Thriller Writers is mm -hmm. staging another event. And um, But for anybody out there who's interested in writing, writers' conferences get expensive fast. So I'm not saying spend spend all your money on them mm -hmm. but if you can pick a good one i think it's usually going to be worth your while to attend uh, one good writers conference a year just to just to meet the people in the business let's switch gears a little bit because another thing that i've always um loved about you is that you are not just a writer you're a reader so i'm always fascinated by what you're reading, what you're enjoying. So what can you tell me about what you have read that you really think readers should take notice of? What might be on your radar for 2023? Okay. I don't have the book in front of me, but I think you and I both enjoyed Isabel Kanya's The Hacienda. Mm -hmm. And that is like a pure version, a wonderfully new pure version of the Gothic. Mm -hmm. And I understand you were telling me that she's got another one coming out. In, I think, late August or early September. It's one of those things where you see it and they're not completely solidified because publishing is a business, so they have to nail things down. But yeah, I think if readers love that, they should watch late summer, early fall. If I translate the title correctly, it's The Vampires of North America. Vampires of El Norte, I think. El Norte, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. So that's Isabel Canas, C-A-N-A-S. Um, this year, because I'm a regular reader and also a friend, 
<laughs> I, read, I read Christina Dodd's point last Amazing. scene, which is a great amnesia story. I studied this <laughs> before I went out to write my own amnesia story. Um, Christina does a great job with amnesia stories, um, point last scene. And she has a new one coming out in March. March, yeah. Forget What You Know. That's mm-hmm. the title, Forget What You Know. Um, Deanna Rayburn's Killers of a Certain Age. Certain age is a lot of fun. It really is. Four women, 60 years old, forcibly retired from a business in which they were paid assassins. And they are given a grand cruise by their boss, their boss who's forced them into retirement. And it soon becomes apparent on the cruise that they are not meant to survive the cruise. So it's it's just a great setup. And, and I hope there's more of that. I hope there's another one. <laughs> That's yeah, and it's so totally different from, I mean, it's not different. Her voice is the same in the books, but she writes these late Victorian feminist kind of mystery romantic adventure novels. And she's done historical romance and another historical mystery series. And then she comes up with this modern thriller with senior sleuths, yeah. senior killers, I guess. Yeah, killers. Yeah, <laughs> skillful (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, that's Deanna Rayburn Um, I must recommend my cousin by marriage Mike Krenz because if I don't I will will feel guilty but um, I have a cousin by marriage Mike Krenz who is a retired Navy doctor and he is doing some really cool really great um, medical mysteries Medical, mm-hmm. medical thrillers. And there aren't a lot of those out there. Remember how we used to always love those medical thrillers, Robin Cook? Well, I think, yeah, for a while it was Robin Cook kind of dominated the market and Tess Garretson did a little bit of yes. kind of suspense with the mystery early in her career's um, career. But, but yeah, you're right. I mean, they could, they really could be, if they're done well, they're scary because it's like, when are you most vulnerable when you're in a hospital or when you're at the doctor's or... So well, in, in his not in his series featuring uh, Dr. Zach Winston, it's the crime shows up in the emergency room, hmm. and it doesn't look like a crime. It looks like a medical emergency, and the stories. So the, the one that's out right now is called Warm and Dead, well, and the reason it's called Warm and Dead is because it turns out that's an ER term, and the, and what it is is um, if you're drown if you're a drowning victim, you're not dead until you're warm and dead. Because drowning victims can often survive, not often, but can survive if their water's cold enough and all that good stuff. So that's that's my my family recommendation. <laughs> and fortunately, he writes very well. So <laughs> one and one thing I'm kind of anxious to. I, I actually got a preview of or a preview. Oh, I'm of, glad you brought that up because that's dark academia. Yes. A school for wayward girls in the 1950s. What could go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Um, A Dangerous Education by Megan Chance. And I think that comes out next month, February. February. Yeah. Um, And this is kind of springing forward from, we've had women in World War II and we've had um, 1920s and we've had the 30s. Um, This is taking the American female experience into the 1950s, which was a very interesting time for for women, and I guess every every time is interesting for for all of us. But um, a dangerous education is an interesting look at dark academia, women and the situation of women in the 1950s, which still influences us today. We are not. I, it's- it's a brilliant book in many ways. She's um, She takes a lot of chances and she succeeds with them. I mean, some editors might tell her, you know, your plots, you've got too many things going on, you know, pare it down, make it simple. But she really brings a lot of threads in. And you're right, reading it, um, you're, you think it's the 1950s, but then you think today there was some of those things are resonating because there was such a fear of what was being taught to students you had this very strict curriculum and you think okay today that's happening and things like that so yeah it's it's an amazing book and it does come out next month okay and what are you recommending in addition well i wanted to uh second your recommendation for that new and upcoming writer christina dodd's uh, march book we we keep plugging her one of these days you know she's (laughs) gonna make it big we just 
uh, forget what you know. Well, it, it just happens that um, I was, it came a, a week or so ago and I have a love hate relationship with Christine, with Christina's books. Um, <laughs> I love how she can just suck me into the story. I mean, once you open it up, that's it. You know, the next day or two, it's gone. Everything else has to be put aside. And that's the hate part. It's like, I have other things I have to do. I can't stop and read you know, every, but I end up doing it. It's um, set in her world of Gothic, uh, the town of Gothic and the California coast. It's got a flower breeder, which I thought was just brilliant because what an interesting career and all that, that stuff about plants in there. And the best way I can describe it is that it reminds me a lot of Hitchcock because I was watching North by Northwest on New Year's Day, which is a tradition with me. And when you think about that movie, it's like this man is mistaken for a, a foreign agent and he's chased across the US in a train and a, a plane tries to kill him by crop dusting and he's running around Mount Rushmore with the female <laughs> mysterious agent. You think there's no way on earth that makes any sense, but Hitchcock pulls it all together and you're just in rapture with that. Christine does the same thing, thing with her plots. She throws all these things in. You think, no, it does It does make sense. And she has a wonderful sense of humor too. So forget what you know does come out in March. I will say with all of these books that you've mentioned, you can always pre-order them through the Poison Pen or your favorite bookstore. And that's always smart in these publishing environments if you want to get a hold of the book. So Christine's book, two from last year, that you may have read or may not, the first one, just like Christina, I, once I read it, that was it, the day was shot, was um, Cloisters by Katie Hayes. It came out in the fall. It's a debut female graduate student um, on the West Coast, gets the chance to intern at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She thinks that's going to make her career because, you know, with an art history degree, it's not that easy to find jobs. <laughs> she gets there and discovers the professor she's going to work with, the curator, has actually been called to Germany, but there's another opening for an intern at the Cloisters, which is this similar museum in the New York City, um, kind of connected to the Metropolitan, but it focuses on medieval art, Renaissance architecture, all those things. She's working with this professor, another student, and they're researching the origins of the tarot card for an exhibit. So That was really interesting. I, I read that. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, it's um, and you do have that kind of hint of, can the cards really predict death because there's a murder? Or is it just somebody manipulating the murder? And the other one from last year that's been up on a lot of uh, award lists uh, at the end of the year is called Lavender House by Lev A.C. Rosen. It's set in the 19, I want to say early 1950s or so. Um, a police detective in San Francisco is discovered to have a secret that pretty much gets him booted off the police force there. He becomes a private eye, is hired by a woman who doesn't think that her wife's death was accidental. And her wife runs this kind of soap making industry. And so it's set in there kind of almost like a country house, but it's outside of San Francisco called Lavender House. And he has to investigate and discover if it really was murder or if it just really was an accidental death. What I loved about the book, and it's um, an adult debut for a young adult author who's he's written some other young adult novels, is how it takes the classic private eye noir mystery and kind of refashions it for modern readers, makes it a little bit more interesting and diverse. I, I read that too, and it was really quite fascinating. Yeah. And, and again, the same era of that 1954, after World War II, 19, early 1950s, um, mm -hmm. that Megan's book is in. And it's kind of an overlooked time in terms of our fiction. Um, but now that authors are delving into it, there's a lot of stories there. Um, the country was really in transition in a lot of ways. A lot was going on. And that makes for a lot of energy in, the, in looking back at the, using it as a fictional setting, I think. Yeah, and I think um, there's been so many wonderful books written during World War II, but at some point, I think maybe readers or somebody reach a saturation point and think, okay, how much more can you tell me about this time period? So writers may be thinking, what's the next interesting terrain? Yeah, I think so. I think so. That's interesting. 
Well, we're almost out of time. So before we do run out, can you tell us what's next for you as an author? I know we had a book from you as Jane Castle, Sweet Water and the Witch. Now we have um, Sleep No More. I'm guessing Amanda Quick is coming up. In May, my Amanda Quick persona. Um, and that is called The Bride Wore White. And it isn't a happy bride. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's more of a Hitchcock sort of bride. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but but it will be set in Burning Cove in 19, late 1930s, which is kind of the era that I settled on for the Amanda Quick name for the past few books. Mm -hmm. And it's been a lot of fun. I think that whole 1930s vibe sort of suits my voice mm -hmm. in a weird way, the same way the Regency did. Yeah, it did. Yeah, where the repartee, um, the back and forth, the dialogue, I, which probably comes down to us actually from the movies that but but that's what we hear in our head when we think of the 1930s we think of the movie movie dialogue and um i i i had a lot of fun with that period it's just it's a fun it's a fun area to to write in so that's the bride war white and that's a very kind of clever reference to some of the classic mystery of the era yeah exactly that was actually my editor's suggestion. That's one of those. Yeah. She's very good at titles. I'm not particularly <laughs> good at titles. I'm too close to the book. That's my problem with the titles. Um, mm -hmm. But my editor, Cindy Wong at Berkeley, um, she she just came right up with it as soon as she read the book. It was like, oh, <laughs> the bride wore white. It was just like she just came. She's brilliant. She's she's just she's really got a talent for spotting um, new and established authors. Yeah, she she just she's she's born to be an editor. And can we hope for another castle, or do you not want to say anything? Nope, I just it's not it's not going away, <laughs> <laughs> whether or not I wanted to. <laughs> the dust bunnies have taken over my Jane Castle world. Like I, um, I don't dare quit now. It's like <laughs> something. <laughs> pretty simple, awful we'll have. Um, but I don't have a title yet, so I mm. nothing. Nothing to say, but yes, there's another one in the works. And how can readers learn more about you and your books? I know you have a website. JaneAnnKrentz.com. That's Jane with a Y. Mm -hmm. And um, JaneAnnKrentz.com is my home on the web. From there, you can get anywhere else. You can get to my Facebook page. Um, my I have an Instagram account. But the information most people want when they go looking for an author, where to sign up for the newsletter, what mm -hmm. the backlist looks like, what books sorted by series, um, all that kind of information is actually at janeannkrentz.com. That's great. And your new book, Before We Forget, is Sleep No More. It's out this week. Uh, copies yeah. available, signed by the author, are available at the Poison Pen because who doesn't want a signed copy? I mean, really, we all do. We all want a signed copy of Jane Ann's. Makes a great book. gift. There you go. Yeah. Valentine's Day is coming up. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> I want to thank Jane for taking time to virtually visit the Poison Pen again. We always appreciate your insight and your wisdom about publishing and writing and your thoughtful book recommendations. And I'd like to thank everyone else for tuning in to another virtual author event at the Poison Pen Bookstore. Thank you so much and Happy New Year, John. Happy New happy Year. New Year.